listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. You know, we take it for granted that everyone that's listening to this podcast right now went through something together that our parents um, and our grandparents um, experienced different versions of. But I'm talking about the pandemic. I'm talking about what you went through as healthcare providers, uh, primarily my favorite providers. That's you pharmacists out there. But if you're a physician, if you're a nurse practitioner, if you're a dentist, for goodness sakes, you're a provider of healthcare. And I don't care what CMS says, you are. And you've done amazing things during this pandemic. I have the honor as a as having a special guest today, Dr. Alex uh, Jahangir, and he is the author of Hotspot, um, a doctor's diary from the pandemic. Um, Alex, I'm so excited and happy to have you here today. Thanks for joining us on the Pharmacy Podcast. Oh, it's such an honor for me to be here with you, and I'm so glad you you said what you said around um, healthcare providers because as for us here in Nashville, this pandemic's response was because of pharmacists, pharmacy students, dentists, dental students, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, and everyone in, in all aspects of healthcare. So it is such an honor to be here with this group of amazing people and to be able to have this dialogue. Thank you. You know, I want the listeners to realize, and you can be found on LinkedIn. I'm going to put your LinkedIn in our show notes. I'm also going to put a link to the hotspot book, A Doctor's uh, Diary from the Pandemic. You're recognized as a leader in your hometown of Nashville, but you're also a board of the Metropolitan Board of Health in Nashville. You have served two terms as chair. You were named the Metropolitan Nashville Coronavirus Task Force as a as someone that really was helping to direct it so you were in the trenches when when this was all breaking out would you kind of give a little bit of your background why did you go into medicine first of all and then talk about the pandemic and how you think that has changed um healthcare forever well i am an orthopedic trauma surgeon so that means i specialize in making order out of chaos so if you show, show someone who presents to me whose leg is dangling, like, I'll know what to do. So you can imagine how even for me, it was kind of wild to see um, all of a sudden an orthopedic surgeon um, be tasked with leading the pandemic response here in Nashville. So I think it's a fair question to start out about how the heck did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, I, spent, I asked my dad a lot in, in the past couple of years, but really here, here's the story. I, um, I'm so fortunate. I, my family and I immigrated from Tehran, Iran, to Nashville, Tennessee in the 80s when I was six years old. And so this community gave me so much. I actually, my first vaccinations, my first um, dental work were conducted in the health department. So when I finally came back to Nashville um, about 13, 14 years ago after I finished my training, um, I wanted to get involved in the community and I started volunteering my time at different things. And I was fortunate that um, one of the mayors appointed me to the Board of Health. Um, somehow within two years of that, I became chair of the board of health in October of 2019. And with one job, that job was to hire a new director of health. We had gone through some, some director changes. Well, I found the director of health and he was scheduled to start March 9th, 2020. First person in Nashville tested positive for COVID was March 7th, 2020. And very quickly, um, we were at, I was asked to just come to a press conference and just say everything will be fine. And, and that was me, my message. Well, as we all learned that, that did not happen the way we were all hoping. And um, we realized within that first week, Mayor Cooper, who's the mayor of Nashville, that um, this was going to be a, a, a whole of community response, right? So the health systems, um, businesses, nonprofits, and he wanted um, somebody to kind of help coordinate all of this. Um, for on behalf of the city and and I was asked to do so thinking honestly it'd be a couple hours a week for a couple of months and so but it was such a amazing opportunity for me to um, 
lead in, in, in the community that gave me so much, the city gave me so much. And we had a lot of great successes. Um, and, you know, one of those, if, if I may, is how important the collaboration amongst our health systems and our um, providers are here in our community. We set up uh, drive through testing sites that were run um, by all of our health systems and eventually by Meharry Medical College, one of the four historically black college universities. And it was their dean of, of dentistry who helped run this um, and who oversaw the entire operation. And we conducted over 400,000 PCR tests, um, 25,000 vaccines during these sites. And then, the, and then we did other events such as the 10,000 um, people vaccinated in one day. And we were able to do that with partnerships um, through um, Belmont University has a pharmacy school here in town. Um, people who were all over Fox Life. And I tell you all that to say, I realized how important partnerships were. And then moving forward, I think the way we're going to have success in, in health um, health care and the delivery of health is engaging everyone, have partners across the spectrum, not just the pro providers. And um, gosh, there's so much more we can dive in there, but I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you for that, Alex. I kind of want to just formulate this big circle that you've traveled in in the on the in the concept of medicine, the concept of of healthcare, and how this pandemic forced us to think differently, as well as become more collaborative. Um, pharmacists have now received more recognition in the United States than ever before because of their response and because of the governors of our 50 states reaching out to community um, pharmacies and long-term care pharmacies and the health system out, outpatient pharmacies to get the vaccine out and to test people and to use their models, which they're used to. They're, 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 they are already prepared for this in, in the way that their business models were. And it certainly did put pressure on them. It put a lot of stress on them. But out of this, I have seen so much good changing the way that physicians and nurses and pharmacists and, and other healthcare providers are working together. So what inspired you out of this, um, this terrible situation to take time and reflect and put this into something that's going to help other providers with regards to the hotspot? So, you know, the, First of all, I, I completely am in agreement with you around the fact that what this pandemic has taught us, especially around the, um, the area of health disparities, is um, the fact that the people who really move the needle are those who are in the community day in, day out. The people who are trusted by those in the community. And, and I mean, gosh, I don't know the numbers, but I suspect there's probably more pharmacies in, in locations than big health systems, right? And and I know for my own family, my mom and dad will go speak with their pharmacist before they'll speak to their two sons or a physician a lot of times because they're in the neighborhood. The, they, the pharmacist has gotten to know my parents. And, and that is, and again, I'm speaking to a group that obviously knows this, but um, that is such an important thing, um, especially around vaccinations. I, I think there's a lot of trust and people who were vaccinated because the person they trusted with everything else before the pandemic, their pharmacist or um, their pastor or in Nashville's case, Meharry Medical College um, and the, the trust that African American community had here in Nashville with them allowed us to have successes in keeping people safe. Super important. What in, what inspired me to write this book is this: six months before the pandemic, my father, my mother-in-law's um, father had passed away. I'd never met him. He was in England. He had dementia, but he had but he had written um, in World War II, where he was a World War II pilot letters to my mother-in-law's mom and I she pulled out these letters after he passed and the letters gave this voice to this person I never had met and it, it ta allowed me and as well as my kids who definitely had never met their great-grandfather to learn so much about what he had gone through when the pandemic hit um, again wrongfully I, I thought it'd be a couple of months and I had really young kids and I have three kids at the time they're five six and eight and I was like, you know what I want to do? I want to just keep a little record from myself so that one day they can say, look, my dad was a part of this. Look what he went through. A year and a half of taking notes. Every day I would write a note of number of cases, number of deaths, and what we did. Problems we faced acutely, so what we did to try to solve it and the immediate impact of our, of our action. 
And I went through that year and realized that um, what we had come up with is this year, the book covers a year pro- time frame in, of March to March. And the city of Nashville and all of our country, frankly, I think there's a universality to this book, um, went through so much, both with the pandemic, with some of the attacks on healthcare, social in- injustice, um, protests. Um, and Nashville, we had a big bombing. Um, the political environment that we all were faced and how all of a sudden we were heroes one day and villains the next. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to, to write about that again at the, at the heart of it. So my kids would have a record, but again, I believe this, this book, um, as hopefully you and your, your listeners will see has the universality that we all went through something, as you said, at the beginning of this. And I hope that these lessons and sharing these will kind of remind people what we went through. So if, if a decade from now or a generation from now we go through all this, we can maybe have some of the shared experience in ways that we succeeded and failed. There's a rawness to your story and to the diary, and the the way that you wrote this is very intimate and very personal. It's almost like I can hear you talking. And when I read this initially, I couldn't hear the sound of your voice. But now that I'm hearing the sound of your voice now, when I read the the introduction, I can hear your inflection and I can hear your passion come through it. So I like the way that this was written. And I want to quote this. It said, on bad days, I was filled with sorrow, frustration, and sometimes more, something unfamiliar. I had known sorrow and frustration. I had known failure. I had struggled to save people's lives and lost them when injuries proved too much to overcome. And here's the part I like best, Alex. But I had never known anger like the anger I felt when people who had the power to solve the massive problems of the pandemic refused to do so, preferring to duck into posture and blame and lie, then leave local officials and volunteers like me to deal with the fallout. Alex, that is so raw. That is so powerful. I get chills when I read it because that's like the third time that I've read it. And that is the combination of the intelligence of somebody who has experienced medicine and healthcare and service and surgery before the pandemic. And then it all crashed together during the pandemic. And now you get to reflect on it and you get to tell the truth from your perspective about other people in the ecosystem of healthcare that are holding us back from doing what you are passionate about doing, and that is caring for people. So I want you to elaborate on that feeling because that is my favorite part um, of the book so far. And in full disclosure, I am not finished with the book, but it has me hooked. Well, thank you. You know, I, you, all of us, enter our chosen profession to, to help people. You know, I, I, I think we probably all wrote that in our uh, um, applications when we applied for our respective schools. And fundamentally, I, I believe everyone really enters healthcare to do that. And, um, you know, it is, it is such a, I remember the first, first time ever as a student or as a, as a new physician, or I'm sure, you know, as a pharmacist or dentist or, any anything when the first feeling of when you know you you reach someone and you've changed the course of their life and will give them another birthday or another decade with covid we now are at a place where we know what to do right we we know masks have certain level of protection vaccines have protection medications such as paxlovid have protection and they're available now. I mean, I, I really think it's amazing how well it's been spread now. Um, but the problem is we've reached a point in, in our society where all those years of schooling that you have or I have or or a true want to make our, our fellow neighbor better is questioned because of what somebody read on the Internet or because they believe there's some hidden agenda and that that saddens me. I mean, I've had um, I, I write about it in the book. Uh, in fact, at the end, you'll see I I have um, had a patient who is a very seasoned executive came in and was involved in a bad wreck, and he had broken a bunch of bones, and and I fixed those. 
And as process is, we always tested any patient who's admitted for um, the coronavirus. This gentleman is probably in his um, mid 60s, early 70s. And he tested positive. And I looked at him, and at this point, I was like, gosh, did you not get vaccinated? He's like, nope, sure didn't. Super smart person. Um, I knew of him by reputation um, in the city. And and when I asked him why, he gave you all the, the talking points you hear on, on, on certain um, echo chambers now. And this gentleman, after his huge surgery that went successfully, ended up three weeks later dying from his infection of, of co- um, coronavirus and COVID. And it just saddens me, right? Because it, it, no matter what we do and we can do, and we all want, we never want to see people struggle and suffer and die. Um, and I fundamentally believe almost everyone in healthcare feels that. And I think that's part of the reason we have, we've had so much um, turnover now in healthcare, so much um, burnout in healthcare. Um, and I want to make sure that we, as, as now people, as seasoned people in healthcare, as, as le- people have leadership positions in healthcare, don't lose. Um, that that energy that we had, the light we all had when we first entered healthcare for the next generation. And so that has really become a passion of mine moving forward. Um, I need to make sure that light is still there um, so that we have great people entering healthcare who make a difference in people's lives so that when I'm older, I I'm, I'm have somebody with that energy taking care of me. I want to go back to, you know, that passage that I, that I read and what, which means a lot to me because I see this in other facets of, of healthcare. And, you know, you and I aren't that far off in, in being in that same generation or re- remember, remembering the temperament and the, the temperature of politics in, in, our, in our younger years, maybe when we were eight, nine, 10 years old, and even in our early 20s, it was not like it is today with so much um, division where um, everything, everything that we talk about has to be politicized. It has to be leveraged for the upper hand of one party to the next party. And I'm frankly sick of it because it, it prevents passionate people like yourself for, from, for caring for people because you run into these roadblocks of people that have the power that don't act to take action because of wanting an upper hand when it comes to um, their agenda or the agenda of their party. Or So let's, let's pause, and I know that politics is always a sensitive subject. To me, it's not. I love talking about it because... You, I don't get offended when it comes to politics. I don't, I don't, no matter what people say, it's just, it's always to me interesting to hear other intelligent people give their reference and testimony. And there's always emotion mixed in it. But I enjoy that where some people just don't and it fires people up. But why has society, I have my opinions as to this, Alex, but why do you think society? has created those barriers from people like you and pharmacists and nurses uh, really doing the work. Why has, what has happened in our society that we're, what they're, what, that we're here today with those barriers? So uh, such a great topic. And I, I too share it with you. I, I think it's important to have dialogue. Um, and frankly, I think that's lesson number one here is until you have serious people having serious conversations with people who different who disagree with them but are civil with each other, you can't get the serious problems in this country taken care of. Period. All right. So pandemic, um, homelessness, hunger, global warming, whatever the topic is. So I also welcome civil discussions. I think um, we have hit a society where, frankly, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you when I was a kid. In middle school and elementary school, I was bullied, all right? I was a kid with a funny name from an evil country, and I did what I did as a kid. I just, it was like, ah, it's fine. I'll get, I moved on. When I entered this role of, uh, in a public role, and then before all this, I had never even had been to a press conference, which has now delivered over 100-something <laughs> of them. Um, what I realized quickly is our, our community and society has become a, a schoolyard full of, of bullies, all, mainly on social media. Yes. And, and I think the social media gives people this platform 
to say whatever they want without consequence. Um, there are certain people who, who are um, demagogues and false leaders who have the ability to, to have changed the course of COVID who chose not to, um, and, and in fact, made it so that it's easy to blame blame the people working hard. And that makes it impossible for us um, as people who want to do good to to act. I don't like if you can go on social media and look me up. I mean, I I am attacked for for the I think the most mundane and dumb and irrational things. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me when rational people choose not to listen to the facts and choose not to engage with a civil discourse with me, um, because I do think I I'm not infallible. There are things I've learned when people have those discussions, and so I think social media is a big blame for that. I think again, as I mentioned, leaders. Um, you know, I, I talk about President Trump in this book um, a, a fair amount. Is I think President Trump, who should his administration should be credited for Operation Warp Speed, he was sick and nearly died. And instead of coming out and say, "Look, this is serious," he decided to um, say that you know this this is I'm going to kiss everyone. I'm good now. I'm Superman. Irrespective of a party, a president is is a position to help guide us to what best for everyone. And, and unfortunately, we had some failures in leadership nationally um, and across states and even some local municipalities. And I think that is, is really an unfortunate place where we are. But I think we need to, as leaders, to have those serious conversations. Um, we need to not buckle, um, because if we're not looking out for our patients and our communities and our family, then who is? Because it's obviously lacking at a higher level. You're just hitting on every point. So I absolutely agree with you. And the answer that I was hoping that you were going to say, you said, and we haven't prefaced this. We started this recording just on a very small 10 minute introduction and you said social media. So I think there is a sociological shift in our society's perception, communication, and ability to disagree, but still move forward because of the impact on our society and on the way that we're raising children and the next generations that that social media based on the internet has has warped communication because on one hand you can literally say anything and not be held responsible for it which you know we have issues there and on the other on the other side of the the spectrum you could be speaking fact and truth and be cancel cultured because you're not fitting the mass agenda of the day, which by the way, is driven by emotion and not driven by intellect and good decision-making. It's, it's knee jerk um, behind the computer screen or be more likely behind the, the mobile phone where someone has an emotion, they fire something off, and then it burns out within a week or it burns out within a week and a half or a month. And and it was it was the hashtag of the month that was popular, that was driving the algorithm of these um, of these platforms uh, that that are that are literally metamorphosizing the way that we communicate as human beings. Um, Alex, I'm old enough to remember and this this does date me where I was writing love letters to girls that I had crushes on, you know, in notes in school and, and think about a note, like no child today between the ages of say five, you know, years through 17 years is sitting there prosing, writing a, a beautiful prose, um, and poetry. And, and I, and I think that, that, that has, changed our society and and I, and I think that there's obviously good that co that comes from social media and and I use social media every day I love it I love our hashtag for for pharmacists it's hashtag twitter rx and hashtag together rx and it's unifying and and there's a lot of camaraderie on the on the flip side there's just so much ugliness and there's so much hatred and and I don't think that it's even real I think half of the stuff that's out on social media is just the, you know, is, is just the rise of the mob mentality rather than being true ways of, of getting through something. And the pandemic showed the true colors 
of both sides. I'm scolding both sides. The the right, absolutely, left, absolutely. The Democrats, the Republicans. You all suck because you yep. you did not serve the public by coming together, and you did not serve the public by lowering your agendas in order to deliver what what our what our country needed. I, I can't I can't say it any better than that. I, I really fundamentally believe, and I never realized it prior, is, is um, so, you know, I have three, I'm raising three young kids, right? And and I worry, again, I, social media has blown my mind. Now, they're good, like, I was able to spread the message, but yep. um, it has been a really, um, it worries me. It worries me as a father of three kids. It worries me about um, civil discourse. It worries me about intellectual discussions amongst people who disagree but are able to disagree in a manner that results in some good. And um, we are okay, we as a society are okay with it. And, and that worries me um, for, for a lot. And again, I think it takes leaders of, of all backgrounds to say that this is enough. And I know there are leaders of both political spectrums that do believe this is, this is not appropriate, but we just need to step up to it. So I appreciate that dialogue. It's just, it's just very, it's very heartfelt to me. So, What's next based on this this book? Once again, I'm going to have links in our show notes. Um, you can get this book um, at hotspottheBook.com. Once again, that's hotspottheBook.com. Uh, Alex, we're going to be sharing this on social media. We're going to be sharing this on LinkedIn. But what do you think's next for people in your position? And you know, there's a one of my most favorite quotes that came from the one and only Stan Lee, and he wrote it into a, um, a Spider-Man movie, was, um, with great power comes great responsibility. And when you took the 8, 10, 12, 16 years of education and experience to get to the point where you're now a respected, um, you know, healthcare professional, a physician, um, you, you have not only taken on that education experience, but you take on, you don the true capes in my, in, in my opinion, you are the true heroes of, of healthcare. So, but with that comes great responsibility. So what is next for healthcare as a unit driving the country to make the country stronger, to, to do something, to take the next step rather than just identifying what issues we're having as healthcare providers and working together, but how can healthcare become an educational factor to showing big tech and to showing the ugly algorithms and to showing the, the populace at large that we need things to change and here's why. And the pandemic can show you how we all survived it and we got through it and people died and 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 there's lots of people that are are now without family members because of it but healthcare rose providers rose together nurses and pharmacists and physicians they all rose together and it's a different world today so what's the next steps yeah you know i so for me i think first of all the i think identifying the problems and then we'll tell you how i think the next step i think some of the problems that um, we all kind of intuitively knew and then the pandemic brought up and what I personally want to really focus on um, as much of my career as I can. Number one is disparities. Uh, I think it is, it, it is not okay that my child and a child born same time next door to each other, right down the hallway here at, at, at the medical center I'm working for because they live three miles apart in the same city, have a 13 year life expect to see difference. Not, not okay. Um, that's a problem we all sort of know intuitively is out there. The pandemic hides in it. But what we saw in Nashville is when we engage with um, trusted people, um, whether it's the new American community and the organizations that work with them or um, the African American community in Nashville and Meharry Medical College, we were able to deliver vaccine equity so that the same percentage of people of all ethnicities receive vaccines. It's doable. It takes intentionality and it takes leadership to to say, you know what, I don't need the credit at, at the big med center to of doing this. Let me give my resources to this person or this organization who has the trust built in to do that. So 
addressing equity um, across disparities around healthcare is a is a true passion of mine. And I think the solution, one big solution, is is doing it through partnerships. And again, breaking the paradigm that you have to come to this big medical center, and I, with all these degrees behind me, um, am the only person that can deliver it appropriately. Not right. We need to do better. That's number one. Number two problem that I'm seeing is is the um, true erosion of people wanting to enter the field of healthcare. So medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, nursing, uh, mental health professionals. I mean, there's such a such a um, a need right now. The average age of a nurse in the state of Tennessee is 58 years old now. And that's because we're not getting younger people in or they're coming in for a year or two and say, this is too hard. We're going to go do something else. We need to make a culture at, at, within our organization that encourages people to enter our profession. And by culture, I know people, when you say culture, people like shut down. But what do I mean by that? I mean, like, let's think differently. Let's, do we need to do, does training need to be the way it's been structured? Does um, you need to have shifts the way they need to have shifts? Is there a way that somebody can do more within their training and within their license um, that really gives them fulfillment that they entered the profession of their ch- choice for the reasons they thought. I don't have all the answers right now. I'm far from from being the expert. But if we don't start thinking about this, we're going to lose people. We're we're going to fall into this funk, and we're not. And it's, it's and we're going to take this with with for as long as I can remember. Historically, been this amazing profession that builds you so much good sense within the community, and 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 we and we'll just erode it to another just trade. And then, then the other final thing is is um, leadership within our communities um, is something that healthcare leaders can do because of the reasons you mentioned. And we need to recognize that we, as a as a profession, have done that over the past two years better than anyone else, and with a lot less of the propaganda and hype of any other profession. Yeah. And we need to get out there and lead on all these other big social problems we have whether it's ha- um, unhoused individuals to food deserts to global warming. And I hope we all we step up and do that. Dr. Alex uh, Jahangir, I am um, honored to have met you. I want to give a shout out to my uh, Finn Partners team and, and uh, Gil Bash, who had you on his podcast. Um, you um, are are one of the the innovators and change makers um, to our current state of healthcare, and we need more um, physicians and pharmacists and and nurses and registered dietitians who think like you're thinking. So I want to encourage everybody that's listening to this: um, go to um, hotspotthebook.com, pick yourself up a, a copy of this. Um, Alex has donated a couple of books that we're going to spread throughout the internet and look out for a contest. Um, if you, um, if you link and, and copy at pharmacy podcast and put in the link hotspot, the book.com, you will be entered to win. And we will pull, um, a couple of those based on, um, based on the, the books that we get from you, Alex, and, and there will be a signed copy. So we're excited about this and promote this, but, um, I hope to have you back. If there's a conference that we're attending um, together, it would be great to sit down and, and talk with you and, and, and get to meet you in person. But this has been a, a, a treat for us and for, for our listeners here at the Pharmacy Podcast. And I appreciate you, Alex. Well, thank you. It's been an honor and I do hope we can connect. And so thank you all for your support. Absolutely. Absolutely.